Hello, friends. Welcome back. It's been a while. It's good to say hello once again. This is the JRPG Report, episode 147. I'm your host, James Fisher. And yes, I am thrilled to be back and with you guys again. We've got stuff to talk about. Uh, wasn't really the case last week and had some uh, some homeschool challenges <laughs> to have to deal with, as most of you guys are probably dealing with the virtual stuff as well. It's just a little overwhelming at times, but we're at least a little bit back to normal this week. And we've got a great podcast for you today. Lots of cool stories to talk about. And at the end, the return of the listener review. It's been a while since we had one of those as well. And so Jake has given me a review of his playthrough of Dragon Star Venire. I still don't know how to say that last word. I guess I probably should have asked him if he <laughs> he knew how to say it uh, either. But um, yeah, we'll do that at the end of the podcast. Uh, keep in mind, if you guys have played a new JRPG that just came out, or even you know some of the classic ones that you heard us talk about, perhaps on the podcast, um, and, and you want to share your experience so either others can... Uh, enjoy the game as you did or hey i don't know if i like this one all that well you might want to want to stay away you are more than welcome to either uh do as shake did and just uh, send me a, a word document to our uh, our email address jrpg report at gmail.com that's easy to remember or you can send me a, a audio file that'd be even better if i don't have to talk for a while you can listen to somebody else's voice uh, besides mine. So let's get into it today. If you hear my voice a bit um, uh, weary, I guess is the best word for it. Um, my other, uh, one of my other jobs I get some, some money through is uh, doing some sports commentary for uh, my alma mater college. And uh, we had our first uh, ball game of the night last night, a double header, and uh, just you know, those muscles, uh, they're a little, a little tired, but we, we shall persevere and get through this one. Um, the big thing that came out actually just a, uh, a few hours ago, and we're going to lead off with it, is we got some new information about Bravely Default 2, a new trailer as well. It went to the, uh, the Snow Kingdom, and I hope I'm saying this correct, of Rheimdahl. Showing off some of the characters and inhabitants of that very cool looking little town. Uh, that we've got five new jobs to talk about. Uh, they talk about some of the subquests and even the mini game they're calling B and D. Uh, so the trailer kind of shows off each one of those little things, and then there was images to go along with that. I'm going to try to have those up in a slideshow as soon as I get done recording this one. Um, the I love the artwork for this game in particular. It's very old school looking, and I can certainly appreciate that. So first about the Snow Kingdom of Rheimdahl. It is a religious nation surrounded by snow and ice, which according to legend was saved by a dragon about a thousand years ago. The Church of Rheimdahl, which worships the dragon that saved the nation as its dragon god, is the country's official religion. Uh, some of the characters that we meet in this trailer are Martha, and she is uh, the Dragoon character. So uh, awesome to see that character back in a JRPG, and going back to your uh, Final Fantasy IV days, who could forget Kane? Um, she is a woman who serves as the guardian of the Dragon Cape, a secret place where the Dragon God is said to inhabit. The Lancer family has served as guardians of the Dragon Cave for generations. And then you have an actual little lizard-like looking dragon who is called uh, Gwyn Gwynlime, a very small little, a little guy, pretty cute looking. He is a small lizard-like creature who suddenly appears in front of Seth and company on their way to the town. He actually speaks a human language in, in the trailer. It's in Japanese. Uh, hopefully we'll get some English uh, stuff for some of this uh, pretty soon. Um, he insists he is the child of the dragon god, and somewhere along the line in the past, he and Adele have crossed paths. Uh, you've got the uh, swordmaster Gladys, and this guy is a friar of the Rheimdahl Church. And um, yeah, it looks to be a very um, kind of looks more like a, a beast master type of just based on the outfit. Um, uh, she 
I'm sorry. This is a girl. I am sorry. <laughs> uh, this is a female character. It says she and Helio the Inquisitor locate fairies deceiving humans and interrogate them. Uh, since her parents were killed by fairies, she continues to hunt them to for revenge to this very day. Uh, so here is the Spirit Master Helio, and appropriately enough, he's got a staff with a sun on it. A man who became the Inquisitor of the Rimedale Church after being recognized by Dominic, the church's high priest. He uncovers humans disguising themselves as harmful fairies and holds divine trials in the court. So it looks like we got some interesting stuff going on in this um, in this town. And then we have uh, Dominic, who is the oracle. He uh, Keep in mind, these are all the... Uh, Asterisks are the job classes that you are going to be learning throughout this game. He is the highest preacher of the church and has a deep trust of the people. His claim, he claims his words are those of the dragon god and that calming climate of the frigid Rimdall is proof of their faith. And lastly, we have the uh, Glenn. He is the south maker of the asterisk holder. And this, this guy is a character. So... Um, it's pretty hard to describe. You'll definitely have to look at the images for it. But he has a, <laughs> what looks to be like a green leprechaun hat. He's holding a shovel in his hand. He's got various uh, tools all about him. And what can only be described as a, an old coffee grinder on his back. It's a, <laughs> it is an interesting look to say the least. And he is the mayor of a village near Rheimdall called Inderno. He is trying to obtain the moonlight grass to save his other brother Grimm, who has fallen into a deep sleep. So that's pretty cool. So here are the jobs that we talked about. Uh, Dragoon dances on the battlefield with a spear in hand, and of course can use the jump attack to uh, fly high into the air and attack enemies as a surprise from the sky. Usually there's a couple turn waits if it's uh, going by old school rules. Uh, the Swordmaster Asterisk slays enemies with counterattacks, a job that wields a sword with a unique stance and overwhelms enemies with a powerful counterattack and pursuits. Uh, you have the Spirit Master, who is the Master of Spirits, a support job able to summon spirits. They ward off the dangers of the battlefield with continuous recovery. Sounds like somebody you should, might want to have in your party at all times. The Oracle... Asterisk is a mudge entrusted with the law, a job that can manipulate law. They can even alter the speed and attributes of the targets. And lastly is the salve maker, a uh, kind of thing, maybe like an alchemist, who's an engineer who draws out the power of tools, a job that can gain various effects by combining items. Uh, yeah, so uh, in addition to the main scenario, there are numbers numerous side quests for players to accept by lending a hand to those in need of your help you can get rewards as well as witness unseen sides of the world and characters you would not otherwise see in the main scenario uh, and then there's lastly they're talking about the b and d game which is called bind and divide it's a popular game in the continent a mini game where each player lays out six cards and invite to occupy the territory by having control of one or more uh, of more of the game board at the end of the match. Um, this is actually unlockable now in the final demo for Bravely Default 2. I've not got a chance to play it just yet. Um, I, uh, I want to so bad and just haven't quite uh, found the time yet. Uh, so yeah, it looks like an interesting little game. Um, like I said, there's a ton of images to go along with that. I'll try to put that into a slideshow or you can check out the link uh, via either our Twitter page or our Facebook group page. You can get the direct link to that article and you can check them out for yourself along with that really cool little video. You can head over to our YouTube channel and check it out there. So yeah, February Fall 2, just a, uh, what, six more weeks. It'll be due out for the Switch exclusively on February 26th, getting you worldwide launch for that. I know a lot of people are pretty excited about it. I'd love to know how you feel about it. If you want to comment on those articles or on our YouTube channel as to how excited you are, I'd love to hear it and, and uh, always try to comment back on each time you guys leave a comment.
The other kind of biggish announcement that we got just uh, last night, actually, we have a release date for Neptunia Virtual Stars, the uh, upcoming hack and slash game from Idea Factory International and developer Compile Heart. It is going to launch physically and digitally for PlayStation 4 on March the 2nd in North America. A couple days later, March the 5th in Europe. Now, Steam users, you got to wait just a little bit longer. That'll be March 29th for its worldwide release. So it'll come out. Uh, it's already out in Japan, but uh, yeah, PC will be a worldwide release. So not too much further to, uh, to wait for that one. It's a very interesting looking game. There was a trailer that goes along with it. And we'd kind of seen some of the running gun aspects of it, but uh, it's also a quick hack and slash type action gameplay as well. Kind of a, uh, a departure for what I had seen in some of the previous Neptunian games uh, in terms of its turn-based battle system, but this one looks to be a almost a straight action uh, game with some shooter elements as well as the sword play to it. It looks pretty fun. Now, the PlayStation 4 and PC versions... Uh, will include Japanese voiceovers as well as English subtitles. Uh, PC will also include those Japanese and traditional Chinese subtitles. But yeah, there's not going to be English any English dub for this game. It's kind of like uh, Tilly Ariza, where hope you like to read because uh, <laughs> you're going to have to do that. And I kind of figure, you know, maybe with this game, uh, because of that gameplay element, there's not going to be a ton of story elements to it. So maybe you didn't, maybe they said, hey, we can get this game out much, much quicker if we don't have to do that English dub and obviously save some, not only time, but money as well. And that seems to be the uh, the route that they went with. So if you would like to check out that trailer, you know where to head, just over to our YouTube channel, JRPG Report. Here are some of the uh, key features of the game. You can switch up and keep moving. Seamlessly switch perspective perspectives between the four goddesses and playable VTubers in fast-paced hack-and-slash battles. They say you can rock enemies with lightning-fast combos and glide across the map to dodge incoming attacks. Uh, not sure how I feel about the whole VTuber thing. That's kind of cool they added that to it, but... You know, obviously, I think the main draw of this one is the the return of the goddesses and getting back to that, you know, that Neptunia style of of humor is always quite unique to it as well. Um, looking forward to this one. I don't love the release date. <laughs> I got to be honest, uh, especially for PlayStation 4 dropping in on March the 2nd. Uh, it's crowded. Uh, it, this early, uh, later starting here, very soon with Ryza 2, uh, we just talked about Bravely Default 2. We've got Yeez 9 in there. Now we've got Neptunia Virtual Stars. we got Near Replicant, and I'm probably forgetting a couple, and there's probably some that haven't been announced yet, but it is, it's pretty heavy <laughs> up here at the beginning of the year, and um, I don't know if you guys are like me, but not exactly rolling in the cash uh, <laughs> during this ongoing pandemic, so... It seems like the, all these game companies kind of got together and said, you know what? I don't really care. We, um, we're going to need that money. <laughs> we're trying to keep uh, people fed um, as well. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, let me add one more uh, to that. We just got the release date for the Switch version of Trails of Cold Steel 4. So North America and European gamers will get that on April the 9th. April 16th for our Oceana country friends. Uh, developer Falcom and publisher NIS America announced. So uh, this new Western release date is about a month after its Japanese release date on the Switch, which is March the 18th. Um, still no word on PC. So typically with these ones, it comes out at the same time. So I maybe they just weren't ready to make that announcement quite yet. I, I, I can't see why it wouldn't be, you know? Um, and obviously they've got time to do that. You're talking about four months away pretty much from now, so or three months. They've, they've got the opportunity to make that. And as soon as I hear about that PC release date, I will pass it along uh, to you guys. So yeah, end of saga for Trails of Cold Steel 4. 
finally getting on the Switch on April 9th. So yeah, if you are a <laughs> if you've been holding off on the Switch and or PC version of this, your spring got even more uh, <laughs> crowded and um, money consuming. But uh, I'm glad it's finally got a release date. I still don't quite understand why there's that delay. Obviously, we were talking about the Switch. They got to kind of compress it down. Um, there is a loss in graphics. There's got to be some some give and take as well in order to fit a massive, massive 130-hour experience full of voice acting down into a Nintendo Switch cartridge. So I kind of understand the delay that way. We don't have that PC release date. I don't understand why it, that takes a while, but when you're dealing with NAS America, you know, general rules don't seem to apply for much of anything. But like I said, it's good to have that release date and uh, a couple months away. So if you've been waiting this long, you can start saving up that cash for it now. <laughs> so, on a personal note, surprise, surprise, I'm still not done with Cold Steel 4. Uh, this game, I knew it was about a 130 hour game and it is every bit of that long. I'm in the final, final stretches of it. Um, I, I definitely got to a, an end point and then it took me like three or four days of doing side quests and, uh, various hidden missions before I could even get to that elusive final dungeon. So yeah, the game just doesn't stop. It keeps on going. Obviously, you're talking about a nine-game arc that needs to be wrapped up, but yeah, still not quite there yet. And I am, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm milking it. Um, I'm enjoying every single minute of it. We've been having a lot of fun on our live streams each night. Um, got a couple regular viewers that make it real interesting. Just It's been kind of fun just talking about, you know, not only, uh, you know, the Trails series, but just kind of gaming in general, life. It's been a good outlet for things and, you know, a lot of fun. Obviously, if you've not played the game, um, you don't want to be joining into a live stream. If you've not played that entire series, you don't want to just jump into a uh, my live stream talking about uh, the final game of the series. Uh, well, into the next one. But, you know, there's a lot of spoilers <laughs> to be had if you should pop in by accident. But, yeah, having a lot of fun with that. If you are curious, you can tune in. Uh, I'm live streaming most every night outside of a couple where I got to work late, uh, anywhere from that, uh, nine 30, 10, and then we wrap it up sometime before midnight. Um, I'll probably dive back into Genshin for just a minute to hold me over, but yeah, Tilia Riza two will be our next live stream that we're going to, um, going to tackle when it comes out on the 26th. Uh, interesting news from Square Enix. And I'm not going to read too much into this. So I'm just going to read you what happened. They filed some trademarks, and they did three of them, right? The trademark first is for Ever Crisis. The second one is for The First Soldier. And the last one is Shinra Electric Power Company logo. I would have figured that one was already done, but I guess not. Um... This was filed back on December the 17th of last year. It just went public today. And of course, wild speculation about <laughs> what that means. Sometimes it doesn't mean anything, okay? Let's be fair. Sometimes it purely means they don't want somebody else, you know, taking a name that they might use in some capacity or, you know, use their properties in ways that they would prefer not to. Uh, the immediate speculation was with Ever Crisis, there's either going to be a remake or a sequel to Crisis Core, the uh, Zack starring Final Fantasy VII spinoff game that came out back in 2007 uh, for the PSP. I didn't realize it had been that long. Uh, I had a Vita, but I didn't have PSP, so I never got a chance to experience that one. Um, obviously, there was those ideas floating around. We all kind of know what what we saw in in remake and uh, <laughs> those actions in there. So it's kind of like, well, does that tie into it? Um, you're talking about first soldier. They saying that might be a reference to Sephiroth. Not surprising there. What are they going to do with that? And well, you know, Shinra Electric Power Company. They just I don't know what they. <laughs> Maybe they didn't want their own evil. Uh, power hungry company rising up in Japan by the same name that would just be kind of weird but 
We'll see what happens with these. I, if I had to bet, it may be a whole lot of nothing. Uh, my immediate joke was that uh, they're going to tease everybody and everybody thinks it's going to be, you know, that remake or sequel to Crisis Core. And then they announce it. And it, yeah, it is one. And it's coming exclusively to mobile. That's my joke. And I really hope that doesn't come true. Uh, but also, it was kind of a half joke because that's entirely possible, guys. We we I talk about them uh, often enough to know how many mobile games are out here, uh, offshoots of popular franchises, or in some cases, completely new entries that the franchise has now moved to mobile. So don't be shocked that that's what it is, but... Really nothing to report on other than the fact that these are trademarks, and um, that's usually the first step in something, but eh, sometimes it's also uh, a bit of nothing. Um, maybe a bit of surprise, we learned a while ago that Dragon Quest Tact, uh, speaking of mobile games, was coming to the West, and it's coming probably sooner than you thought. It's going to arrive in the West on January the 27th. This is a tactical RPG from the makers of the Dragon Quest series, and it will be available for both iOS and Android starting on January the 7th. Uh, that is being published by Square Enix and developed by Aiming. Uh, Pre-registration is available right now. You can earn a King Slime early access bonus. Um, I don't know about this one. Like, I, I really do like the look of it. It seems like a decent idea. I just, you guys know me. I've talked publicly about my, uh, I guess, inability to play uh, uh, strategy RPGs. This looks to be along those same lines. However, it's free. It's on mobile. I love Dragon Quest, so maybe it kind of might be worth a time and trouble. Um, I've been disappointed, especially with, what was that Stars one that came out a while back. It was just... Oh, man, it was bad. I didn't care for that one. So maybe this one is a bit better. The look of it matches exactly what I would think. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. If I end up doing that, I'll let you guys know if it's worth um, <laughs> your time to have a free download or not. If you are patiently waiting for the release of Yee's Nine Monstrum Nox, uh, well, you don't have to wait too much longer, February 2nd in North America, February 5th in Europe, uh, you can go and check out the demo. It dropped on the PlayStation Store um, like last week, wasn't it? Uh, back on January the 4th. So yeah, you know it's been a while since we talked. So in case you didn't know it, there is a demo for Yeez 9 on there. You can check out uh, two different locations in it. There's no real story parts to it. This is just gameplay. And uh, you can either go to uh, down to the, uh, the sewer level or another uh, tower type level. I forget the exact... Uh, names of it. I, I did check out the uh, sewer one for uh, about five minutes or so before getting destroyed by a giant crab. Um, <laughs> uh, if you guys know this or not, I have not actually played any of the Yeez titles. I finally did pick up part eight, and I would like to play that at some point. I did. I think I remember, and I might have said that, shared this. I, I did try the demo for eight, and I wasn't impressed. But it was early, and I think there were some things wrong with it. Um, I was I was impressed with this one for nine. It is it's fast and it's furious, and it certainly looks like it's a lot of fun. I just don't know what I'm doing. Okay, <laughs> I was able to stumble through the uh, the regular bats or whatever that were were flying at me and do just fine. But as soon as I went up against uh, any sort of uh, formidable uh, opponent. I was dead <laughs> and uh, didn't feel too good about it. So uh, maybe I just need to uh, figure out what I'm doing. What I mean, uh, I should probably at least look and see what the buttons were supposed to do before just jumping right into it. But that was probably my first mistake. But yeah, if you're looking to check that demo out, you can do so. Um, not too much longer to wait on the game. So if you're kind of on the fence about it, it's a good way to know whether or not you're going to be uh, up for it. It looks a good opportunity. I'm always in favor of, of demos you can check out before having to um, throw down on some, some money. Here's an update for a game that was announced back in March of 2019. Um, I Honestly, I'd kind of forgotten about this one. I barely remember it. A game called Fantasian. 
Uh, you may not recognize that. I certainly didn't. But you will know and recognize who worked on it. Uh, this is the Mistwalker developed RPG, which is supposed to be due out sometime this year. Uh, this is by producer uh, Sakaguchi. He, uh, he shared his in-game progress screenshot for it. Looks, uh, I mean, doesn't look super impressive, but also looks pretty good. Um, kind of harken back to some old, um, some older games of of yesteryear. Um, what you'll also recognize is the music, and that is by Nobu Umamatsu. Uh, Final Fantasy fame. So those two are working together on, on a new game. It is a world of a unique world of handcrafted dioramas. So I have shared that uh, article on our social channels. If you'd like to check it out, two images kind of showing off what the game looks to be about. I would dare say we need some more um, shown from this game to, before I would believe it's coming out in 2021. Now, keep in mind, this one is for smartphones, so that's maybe why I'm not blown away by the visuals on it. So now that I see that it's for smartphones, that does make me feel a little bit better about what I'm looking at in terms of uh, being impressed or not. Um, that's probably going to off-put uh, most of you guys <laughs> as far as looking forward to it or not now. Uh, speaking of demos, there's a new demo for Monster Hunter Rise on the Nintendo eShop. Uh, if you're one to check it out, you'll need to do so uh, fairly quickly, as it is a limited time demo, only available until February the 1st at uh, midnight. So you got about two weeks to check that one out, and that, of course, is a Switch exclusive over on the eShop. You won't do that. There's been a whole bunch of uh, Monster Hunter Rise information come out here lately. Tons of uh, trailers. Uh, they did that live stream, which introduced a whole bunch of stuff. So there's uh, there's a lot of stuff to, to uh, catch up on if you're looking forward to this one. Head over to our YouTube channel. I've got all those things pointed out for you. You can check out the entire live stream. Uh, there's different trailers broken up for it. So if you're looking forward to that, check out the demo and check out all the media. You don't have to uh, wait too much longer. This one will be coming out fairly soon. I don't see the release date. There it is. There it is. March 26th for the Switch. So yet, yet another... Uh, game joining our big um, spring lineup for JRPGs. I want to talk to you guys for a minute about a brand new JRPG that come across the uh, websites today, and this is called Gen Conception. It is announced as a PC title coming sometime to Steam in 2021. So this is kind of one of those retro-looking uh, games, and so the best way I can describe it, so it's got eight playable characters with intertwining stories. So that kind of sounds like the Saga games, right? Um, definitely has that old-school look to it. Um, can't quite put my finger on what it reminds me of, but yeah, definitely like a Super Nintendo uh, type of graphical style. Uh, the gameplay is oddly reminiscent, not quite the action or the um, the timing based. It is purely turn based, um, but it's kind of got like some Chrono Trigger vibes to it. A um, lot of other little things that just uh, it kind of looks like a meshing of a bunch of different genres. But it is being described as uh, where is the. Uh, <laughs> It's a social deduction fantasy thriller turn-based RPG. So I haven't heard um, that one as a description before. So here we go. Uh, eight playable character stories intertwine when three characters enter final layer and two vanish without a trace. One returns back from the final layer but claims not to know what happened. Who do you trust? Who is telling the truth? And who is lying? Who is friend and who is foe? Uh, development for Gen Conception started back in July of 2019. It's uh, I'm not sure what this means, but it said it is using SFML. So maybe that's some sort of programming language for you guys out there. Uh, here are the key features of it. It is strategic turn-based combat involving balance. Battles happen on the same field as movement. No switching screens when combat starts. Uh, affliction and buff system, for example, players cannot run away if they have a stuck affliction. 
Double and triple gen techs allow party members to combine attacks with each other to form stronger attacks. So I say it kind of got some some Chrono Trigger vibes to it, all on the same screen. Like your the enemy animations are a little reminiscent of it as well. Um, in particular, there's like a um, a giant worm creature in the trailer that swallows one of the characters and like spits them out. And I was like, that's like pure Chrono Trigger. This is awesome. Uh, traps can even be set in combat for strategic purposes, such as delaying the attack for later. Uh, promising looking little game. I really like what I'm seeing on this one. Um, you can check out that trailer over on our YouTube channel. There was a couple images that go along with the description if you want to read it and see for yourself via our Facebook or Twitter pages. Um, we talked about logo trademarks a while ago for Square Enix. Well, uh, Firayu also did this with a trademark logo for Caligula 2 in Japan back on December the 10th. Would imply there's a sequel coming out to the original uh, Caligula, which was then called the Caligula Effect in the West. That first launched back on the Vita back in June of 2016. We got it in May of 2017. In the West, there was also that remake subtitled Overdose, which came out for PS4 uh, a little bit later. Uh, the sequel has yet to be officially announced. Uh, the series producer did tease a sequel back in June of 2020. So, yeah, that uh, trademark teasings about the right time frame, you'd have to imagine um, that that is probably coming fairly soon. If you are an Xbox Game Pass owner and looking for more Final Fantasy uh, games coming out to it, a uh, representative said that there are more coming that they have uh, supported throughout 2020 and will continue to do so in 2021. Um, of course, they've got Final Fantasy 15 on there, uh, 9, 8, and uh, Final Fantasy 8 Remastered. I'm sorry, this, I'm sorry, I got my Roman numerals wrong there. The original Final Fantasy VII is on there, and now eight remastered as well. So that leaves 10 slash 10 to remaster not on there, 12 Zodiac Age is not on, and the 13 trilogy not yet available on Xbox Game Pass. I'm sure they're coming. Uh, it's only a matter of time. The, the way they spaced out the ones in 2020, I would imagine, yeah, every couple months, You'll get a new one. Obviously, ones go off as well. But uh, if you are a Game Pass owner, it's already an excellent deal. Looks like you've got some some more things coming to you here soon. Uh, got some new trailers or a new trailer featuring off the new features of Saviors of Sapphire Wings and the Stranger of Sword City Revisited. Um, introducing uh, three new classes, additional battle elements, Expanded character creation and three new dungeons. You can check that trailer out on our YouTube channel. This game is due out for Switch and PC via Steam on March 16th in North America and March 19th in Europe. Uh, a new game coming out, which is an old game, and well, I'm not sure if we're going to get it yet or not, but uh, uh, Akaba's Trip Hellbound and Debriefed got a Japanese trailer as well as a release date for it which is may 20th in japan um so this is a high definition remaster of the psp game akaba's trip plus um now no official official announcement on the western date however back when this game was first kind of teased and talked about which was uh, back in 2019, publisher Xseed Games did say that they were going to release this in the West. Um, so it's probably definitely coming. We just need to kind of reaffirm those things as it was a while ago. Everything kind of got pushed back with COVID. Well, you know, all that fun stuff we've been talking about for so long. So I would dare say there's, you know, a 99% chance this is coming to the West with it coming out in May in Japan. You're probably talking at least a few more months until we see it over on uh, on these shores. I never got a chance to play uh, the other uh, game in the series. It was 
Um, I guess interesting is the correct word uh, for it. A very mature title with some uh, questionable uh, mechanics in battle to it, but it uh, looks like a fun time, and uh, maybe might check this one out. Who knows? Um, well, thank you. I don't know if you guys heard <laughs> <laughs> heard that uh, notification or not um, coming as no real surprise but there was a uh, cool video from some of the uh, a couple of the voice actors from Persona 5 Strikers um, Erica Larcher uh, and uh, Cassandra Lee Morris had a chat with each other they um, I think it was for um, one of their YouTube channels and they kind of just talked about um, some of the challenges obviously of recording during the pandemic, and they said, and this is kind of, this is interesting, so they said recording was supposed to start back in April, then the quarantine went into effect, so they were not allowed to, uh, allowed to do voice work, they came up with the plan B, which was, hey, let's ship <laughs> uh, equipment and microphones to the voice actors, they can record it, and then we can mix it back in the studio, seems like a pretty, um, easy thing, and I'm assuming that's what most have done. Uh, they definitely uh, talked about the fact that they they knew a Western version was coming, had done the work for it, and couldn't announce it until, you know, the game got officially announced just a few weeks ago. So that's that had to be really challenging, uh, kind of hiding this knowledge you know, from fans who no doubt, I mean, pester is probably not the right word. Because people are just, they're anxious to play this game that they kind of figure is coming, but there's no news on it. So, well, the voice actors will know. Surely they've done the lines for it and they just weren't allowed to say anything for it. So I kind of feel bad for these people, the spot that they were put into. But obviously they're also making a living doing this. So it's part of the job. I guess, but the, the the good news is the game is coming. We're going to get it uh, very shortly. Very much looking forward to Persona 5 Strikers, but it was cool to see kind of that insight into uh, that world. All right, guys, that's the end of all the news for the week, but we have one final segment for you, and that is going to be our reader review from Jake. He has uh, put some, I was going to say pen to paper, but we don't really do that anymore, do we? Um, he has typed out a very thorough review of Dragon Star of Venire. And um, it, sit back and relax. It's, <laughs> it is well thought out and well written. Um, and I, I was going to kind of cut some things out of it to make it a little shorter, but I don't feel like that'd be fair because I think Jake's done a really good, really good job of explaining each part of the game. And I want you to uh, get the entire effect of, of what he was trying to say. So. If you don't care, if you're not going to play the game, you can go ahead and, and cut off. We're not going to talk about anything afterwards. But, uh, yeah, I am going to give the full credit is due for the game. So here is his review of it. While this game has the potential to be one of the great hidden gems of our genre, it is held back by a couple minor flaws and one major one. Overall, this is a good game. So let's focus on the positives first, beginning with the story. The story is just as good as a premise would suggest. This world contains three major races, humans, dragons, and witches, with, with your party taking the viewpoint of the latter. Basically, humans view witches as evil because they give birth to dragons, which appear to be mindless beasts who try to eat everything they come across. Witches, on the other hand, are cursed to give birth to dragons, which kills them. I won't go any further into the story to avoid spoilers, but the narrative is captivating from start to finish, as you would expect from the summary I just gave. It's a brutal way of life, and you get to see that play out. The game is not very long, which works in the story's favor because there's no fluff added just to lengthen it. I will have gotten the Platinum Trophy in about 45 hours, which will be for two playthroughs. I skipped all the event scenes the second time through until I got to the final chapter, and that is where the branching point occurs for the different endings. I like the story enough that I maybe want to see each of the endings, so that speaks in its favor. The next positive point that I want to focus on is the character progression, not only from a narrative standpoint, but from a battle standpoint. Other than basic leveling up and equipment, which just increases your stats, character growth is entirely based on devouring enemies in battle. Witches need to consume dragons in order to prevent themselves from going insane, and this plays out beautifully in battle. 
Every, every enemy has a unique dragon core. That successfully devouring a dragon in battle allows the character that is consumed it to acquire its core and unlock abilities and passive stats that power them up. You can then equip a limited number of those abilities to each character, which allows for a massive amount of customization and diversity. You can also switch characters out in battle on the fly, so swapping members in and out so everyone can obtain various dragon cores feels pretty smooth. Okay, so all that sounds pretty cool, right? Well, it is. Unfortunately, there are some flaws that kind of hold this game back. This game comes with a lower budget developer compared to some of the larger, more familiar ones. So, while it definitely has some great building blocks that would have made it epic, it doesn't quite get there. I do want to point out, though, that the developer, Compile Heart, has largely been criticized for their low-level game developing prior to this game. Uh, however, from the research I've done, it seems this game was a significant step up in terms of development compared to their prior titles. So perhaps we can hope for a bigger and better from them in the future. Now, the majority of the game plays out like a visual novel, which is fine. However, there are a couple scenes that are fully rendered. And they look good, not great, but still solid. Had the whole game played out this way, it would have served the game well, especially had we gotten to see some dragons animated in this fashion. I can only assume that they didn't do this because they didn't want to spend that much money making the game. It's by no means a deal breaker, but definitely a missed opportunity. However, this pales in comparison to the game's major flaw, and that is the Little Sisters mechanic. Introduced a few chapters in, you are charged with keeping three Little Sister witches fed. Like I said earlier, witches need to eat dragons in order to prevent them from going insane. However, eat too much and the dragon inside them bursts through their stomach and rips them apart. Ugh. From a narrative standpoint, this is really intriguing. From a gameplay mechanic perspective, they are really f they really fail to deliver here. Each little sister has two gauges. One gauge fills as you feed them. Feed them too much and the dragon bursts out and kills them. The second is a madness meter. Don't feed them enough and they go insane and disappear. Feeding them decreases madness, so you need to balance the two. Unfortunately, there's no way to decrease the first gauge, so if you keep playing the game for long enough, you'll eventually lose the girls. What causes the madness to rise is, unfortunately, exploring the dungeons, specifically fighting too many battles and collecting items. Now, I could easily go on a profanity lace tirade about what a BS mechanic this is, but I'll leave that for a race here podcast. Thank you, Jake. Uh, suffice to say, you cannot go exploring and collecting everything in every dungeon without losing the girls. You can choose to ignore this mechanic, but losing the girls causes the, the party's overall madness gauge to increase. This is separate from the little sister's madness. The party's overall madness will affect the ending, uh, so you can't ignore it completely if you want the better endings, and is the main reason why I decided halfway through the game that I was going to do a second playthrough. So please don't let this deter you from giving this game a shot. I know I ranted about it, but it's only because it's mind-boggling to me that they tie this mechanic to what makes a JRPG so great, and this, is definitely, and this game definitely has the potential to be just that. His favorite part of JRPGs is exploring an unknown world. And the game essentially punishes you for doing that. I just don't get it, and hopefully Compile Heart learns from this and doesn't do it again. Moving on, there is uh, no real world map for the game. Each dungeon is selected from a list, when, which expands as the game progresses. You will either be uh, in menus, picking a dungeon, shopping, or strengthening your party, or you'll be watching story scenes and exploring the dungeon. Overall, it's pretty well balanced. There are a couple things I wanted to touch on, all of which work in favor of this game. For the scenes that are voiced, the voice acting is pretty good, and you'll even find some familiar voices. Most notably is Edward Bosco, who voices Machias in the Cold Steel games, Erica Harlitcher, which we just talked about, <laughs> who does Yuna from Cold Steel 3 and 4, and Anne, uh, and Anne from Persona 5, and finally, Laura Post, who voices Consumi in Persona 5 Royal. There are uh, some DLC for this game, uh, about half of which is free, which is nice. The other DLC is very reasonably priced, should you wish to purchase it, although I did not. 
None of the DLC really adds anything to the game overall, aside from a higher difficulty level, but it's always nice to have the option. The characters are likable enough, and there are even some uh, optional bonding events that you can do for other party members, similar to Code Steel. You can ask that, access them by giving characters gifts, which will allow for a character epilogue to play for one of them if you get the best ending. You can see all the events in one playthrough, but if you only get one special epilogue at the end of the game. So you have to beat the final boss multiple times in order to see them all and pop all the trophies associated with them. But that would not take very long if you know what you're doing and skip the event scenes surrounding the boss fights prior to the epilogues playing. The battles are fun and can be very quick once you get the hang of them. They take place in mid-air, and you can move around to any one of the three different levels depending on how you want to position your party and where the enemy is. It's not nearly as complicated, even as that makes it sound, but there's, uh, but there's very little thought that needs to go into it. You can, play it with more, uh, you can play it with traps if you want to for enemies on their side of the grid and knock them into those traps, but I never did that even once. There's a wide variety of spells and skills, and each character can be customized with them however you want. So I used those more than traps to deal damage and collect cores. Attack animations can be skipped by holding R2, so you can breeze through all of them if you find yourself getting tired of them for a while. But they do look pretty cool. Overall, I'd recommend giving this game a go, despite its major flaw in the Little Sisters mechanic. The rest of, his, uh, the, the rest of it rates from very good to great, and I enjoyed my time with it. I found it physically for $40 on Amazon, and it's even cheaper on the PSN store. And I thought that price was just about right. For an intriguing story, fun gameplay, and an excellent customization system, you can't ask for much bang for your buck than from Dragonstar Venar. We appreciate that, Jake. That's very cool. Um, I'll go ahead and um, copy and paste that onto our uh, social media channels if you guys want to take a look at it, and maybe I've stumbled over a couple words, and you want to say, hey, I would like to just read that on my own time, Mr. Fisher. Thank you very much. And you can, <laughs> I will allow you to do that. But that's all we have for episode 147. Like I said before, it's a pleasure to uh, to be back with you guys again. If you'll do me a favor and head on over to uh, wherever you listen to this podcast and give it a good review, that'll help push it out to more and more people. Give us a like on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Don't forget to like in, uh, our videos and subscribe to our channel on all the old YouTubes. And uh, if you are so inclined, we are still doing listener support, either through this app uh, on Anchor, you can do it through the link, or if you choose through Patreon, I would be happy to accept either method of support. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Fisher, and uh, until next time, get back out there and level up.